Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the 11th episode of the MH podcast. I'm joined with an esteemed guest. He is Dr. Richard or Professor Richard Wolf, who's a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and a visiting professor in a graduate program in international affairs of the New School University, New York City. He is the founder of Democracy, Democracy at Work and the host of their nation, nationally syndicated show, Economics, uh, Economic Update. His latest book is The Sickness is the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics, um, or itself, and is available along with other books uh, on a link which we'll be providing on the bottom of the um, of the def- of the um, bio, um, sorry, uh, in the comments section below. H- how are you doing, Professor? Thank you uh, for inviting me, and I'm fine. T- tell us, Professor, how you got into, um, you know, this uh, it got into economics in the first place. What what made you interested in this field? Well, it's a it is actually an interesting story. I went to college mm. um, here in the United States, where I was born. Uh, intending to be a, a natural scientist. I don't know, physicist, chemist, that's what my parents wanted me to be. And in my first year, I took a course in economics because I was always interested uh, in how the economy worked. Psst. Psst. I can't do this. Excuse me. Um, And I went to this economics course and hoping to learn about how economies work and so forth. And the sad result was I was treated to a group of economics equations that didn't make much sense to me or to the other students. Everything was discussed in terms of what explains prices. I didn't take a course in economics to understand why prices are what they are. I wanted to understand the big questions Uh, Why are some countries rich and others poor? Why is there wealth uh, on one side of the town and poverty on the other? Uh, Living in New York City area, I knew that story really well from personal experience, et cetera, et cetera. But economics had nothing to say to me. So I majored in history and I finished my program studying history. And the more I studied history, the more I recognized that it was the economy that shaped so much of what happened in history that I kind of had to bite my tongue and go back and Mm -hmm. learn the economics. So I went to graduate school in economics and it was always a contest. What I was taught was not what I wanted to learn. What I was taught was mostly why the system we're living in, capitalism, although it was taboo to call it that at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our professors, were professors of the Cold War here in the United States, where anything that sounded, looked, or had any vague resemblance to anything socialist, Marxist, or anything like that, was so taboo that even words like capitalism were not supposed to be used. Um, And so I was always in a a kind of struggle with my professors. Um, And what that did is shaped me. It shaped me because I had to learn to be able to argue with them, to be able to defend my critical perspective on Mm -hmm. what I was learning. And I found a few other students like myself, and we began what I did throughout my career, studying on my own with a student or two or three with me um, who had similar interests. And then in a sense, I had two parallel tracks, the official appropriate, economics, mainstream economics, microeconomics, macro, uh, all of that I had to learn. Mm. But on my own, I learned to my great delight that there was a vast literature which I could access in the library Mm. of people who were critical of capitalism Mm. so that I could get in my classes all of the arguments for capitalism And then as I went to the library with my friends, we could also read and think about a critical perspective, which was totally absent. And let me stress that, which may interest your your audience. I went to the, what are usually considered the foremost universities in the United States. Mm -hmm. I was an undergraduate at a place called Harvard. I then went to graduate school for a while at Stanford in California. 
and I finished and got my PhD in economics at Yale University. So uh, I'm like a poster boy for elite education here in the United States. I spent 10 years of my life uh, in the undergraduate and graduate learning program, 10 contiguous years. That's 20 semesters, two semesters per year. Mm -hmm. During that time, in 19 out of the 20 semesters, I was not assigned to read one word critical of capitalism. 19 of those semesters were studies in celebrating how efficient capitalism was, how beautifully organized, how equitable, I kid you not, even though we lived in a society where difference of income and wealth and power were obvious. We were constantly told, no, 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 this is the best system the human mind has been able to develop. In one semester, one professor in Stanford, California, did give us a little bit of a critical perspective. And mm -hmm. I was grateful to him for doing that. Mm -hmm. But it gives you an idea of how lopsided it was. And, and I hasten to add, my teachers were good teachers. It wasn't that. They were terrified. Mm -hmm. It was a disaster for them personally. Their careers would be badly affected if they were knowledgeable about, if they talked about, even if they weren't supportive of a critical perspective, the very decision to put such things on a reading list mm. would make others suspicious, question them. It was really a time, even in the best universities, mm. of a intellectual conformity that is now hampering here in the United States any reasonable ability to deal with the crises that we face mm. because nobody was trained to think about, to analyze when capitalism breaks down, mm. which it is now doing. So tell, tell us about this diagnostic, this critical perspective. What exactly of the system here um, needs to be outlined as fa a failure or what exactly did you see was going wrong with capitalism such that you developed this critical perspective in the first place? Good. Let me go backwards in time. Mm. Uh, let me mention the two big failures that mm. are now rapidly, and I mean that, and more so than at any point in my life, and mm. you can see from my hair that I'm not a young man. I've been here a long time. I'm born in the United States. I've lived all my life in the United States. Mm. I can assure you that the criticism the critical attitude towards capitalism is greater right now as I'm speaking to you in the United States than at any point in the history of this country as so far as I have lived here. Um, it's extraordinary. And the two things that are right now fueling this criticism are the failure, the failure to anticipate or to prepare for or to manage the economic crash of capitalism, which begins in uh, February of this year. Yeah. Uh, extraordinary, producing tens of millions of unemployed people mm -hmm. at this moment, uh, over 60 million, that's a third of our labor force, has had to apply for unemployment compensation mm -hmm. at some point over the last eight or nine months, with millions of them unemployed for the whole period of time. Yeah. Uh, that is spectacular as a crisis. Mm -hmm. It makes this system as, as poorly functioning as the last time something like this happened, which was the Great Depression of the 1930s. The second thing right now shaping anti-capitalism is the failure of the United States' kind of capitalism to prepare for or to manage the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We've just crossed 300,000 dead Americans. Mm -hmm. To give you a perspective, this pandemic in less than a year has killed more people than Americans died in World War II. Wow. In other words, this crisis mm -hmm. of public health is a more devastating impact on this country than any war it has fought since the Civil War. 
uh, which was in 1860, to give you an idea. But even before the crisis of today, of this year, there were two things about capitalism, at least here in the United States, that began to develop a critical mo movement and momentum. Uh, and it's very easy to describe. The first one, and probably the most important, is inequality. Mm -hmm. In other words, the gap, the difference between the richest at the top mm -hmm. and the mass of people. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States, you, you need to see it historically, mm -hmm. celebrated that in the 20th century, at least in the 20th century after the Great Depression, there was a compression of inequality. To give you an example, extreme inequality in the 1920s, but with the crash in 1929, in the 1930s, there was a massive movement from below. The Congress of Industrial Organizations was the greatest unionization movement in American history. In the 1930s, roughly from 1932 to 1938, roughly, more people joined labor unions in America than had ever done it before, and more joined than have ever done it since. It is the high point of millions of Americans who had never been in a labor union before, deciding that with the collapse of capitalism in the 1930s, their best chance as individuals, as families, as regions, as communities, was to join labor unions. It was fantastic. At the same time, there were even more radicalized people who joined two different socialist parties and a communist party. And the two socialist parties and the communist party and the CIO, the labor movement, all worked together. And they went to the president of the United States at that time, Franklin Roosevelt by name. And they said to him, by the way, uh, a centrist Democrat, rather like Joseph Biden uh, in terms of his politics. Mm -hmm. And they went to him and they basically said to him a straightforward story. Mm -hmm. uh, we represent 30, 40 million people. We have organized them into unions, into political parties. And we're telling you, Mr. President, very politely, we're telling you, you have to help the mass of people in this country get through this crash of capitalism. If you do, we will make you a hero. And if you don't, we will throw you out of office. And Mr. Roosevelt was a smart politician. He understood that this coalition was called in those days, the New Deal coalition in the United States, unions, socialists and communists could deliver on their threat. It was not an empty threat. And so he said to them, Okay, we'll make a deal. I will do for you and the mass of people what has never been done by a president in this country. But in return, I don't want to hear any more about revolution, socialism, none of that. That's the deal. And that deal was accepted. And it, over the next few years, the middle of the 1930s, here's what was done. And, and remember, it's a crisis with millions of unemployed. The government is bankrupt because the unemployed don't pay taxes. Businesses have collapsed. In the midst of all of that, the government created Social Security, a pension program for every American. When you reach age 65, the government gives you a check every month for the rest of your life. That was created in the middle of the Depression. Number two, the first unemployment compensation system at the federal level. If you lose your job, and by the way, at that time, there were tens of millions without work. If you lose your job, the government will give you a check for one half year or more, simply because you are unemployed every week. Number three, the first minimum wage so that employers could not pay below a living wage that would allow people to have a minimum decent life. And number four, a federal jobs program. And here's what the president said. If the private capitalist sector either cannot or will not 
employ millions of Americans who only ask for a job, then I, as president, said Roosevelt, I will. And between 1934 and 1940, the federal government hired 15 million unemployed people and gave them a decent wage. And if you ask, as you should, where did the money come to pay for all of this? Here's the answer. Roosevelt, the Democratic Party in power, taxed corporations and the rich heavily and also required loans from them to the government to pay for all of this. So let me underscore it because in every part of the world, this needs to be understood. In the 1930s, a massive program to help the poor, to help the middle class survive and grow, have jobs, have incomes, keep their homes, all of it was done by the president, was paid for by the corporations and the rich. They weren't happy about it, but they had to do it. And the reward that Mr. Roosevelt got was he was reelected three times. No other president in history of this country ever achieved that. Not before Mr. Roosevelt and not since. Wow. The lesson here, the politician who does for the mass of people more than any other president is also the most popular president this country had. And that is part of the consciousness, even if you don't hear that story told. Well, what this did was for the rest of the 20th century, make American capitalism, US capitalism, much less unequal mm -hmm. than, for example, British or French or German or mm -hmm. Italian capitalism. Mm -hmm. And the capitalists tried to make something good out of what was forced on them. So we began to celebrate when I went to school, isn't capitalism wonderful because we have a vast middle class? Yeah, the irony is the vast middle class was created by labor unions, socialists and communists in the middle of the Great Depression. It wasn't the gift of capitalism. It was forced on capitalists from below. But nonetheless, that was the ideology, capitalism makes us all wealthy or at least middle class, comfortable, our own home, our own automobile, all of that. And when you do that in a society and you do it for decades, as we did roughly from the 1940s right to the present, if then you change that, if suddenly you take away from the middle class what they won in the 1930s, when you recreate the pre-1929 inequality of the United States, which is what we've done in the last 25 years, you produce rage, anger, bitterness, as the mass of people find themselves further and further behind the mythology, the so-called American dream of everybody having a kind of middle-class life. That's not true for the mass of people. And they're what here? And they're watching that situation get worse and worse, worse for them, worse even for the prospects for their children. And that's that inequality in our history is making people question the whole system in a way, as I said, I have never seen before. The second, and there's only two, the second quality of capitalism that is now working together with this inequality to provoke system criticism is what I would call instability. Wherever capitalism has settled for the last 300 years, all over the world, you have an economic downturn on average every four to seven years. You know, that's an average. So sometimes it takes longer, sometimes it takes less. But on average, for every four to seven years, here's what happens. Suddenly, sizable numbers of people lose their jobs. Their skills haven't gone away. 
the importance of what they do hasn't gone away. The needs of the society for labor and its products hasn't gone away, but your job went away and with it, your income. Businesses have to cut back or they go out of business. We have many words because this is so common. Recession, depression, bust, crisis, downturn, collapse, crash, I mean, lots of words, because it is so ever present. It means that your lifetime, you and I, being normally whatever it is, 50 to 80 years, we're going to experience quite a few of these, which are gonna interrupt our families, our relationships, our educations, our jobs, our regional locations. It's extremely disruptive especially when the downturns are deep and long lasting, mm -hmm. which the 1930s was and which today's is. Mm -hmm. You put together the instability of this system and the inequality it is generating, and you have two fundamental flaws of a system that make people ask the logical question. If this system is so unstable, and produces such inequality. Mm -hmm. If on top of it, it is un incapable of handling the preservation of public health in the face of a virus, yeah. well then, why don't we consider another system? I think that's a good question. And I think a lot of people will, will agree with large parts of your diagnostic there. Um, I mean, here's what I've understood from what you've said. You've obviously used the example of the, you know, the Wall Street crash and the subsequent Great Depression in the 30s as like the prime example of how this system malfunctions, both in terms of stability and in terms of inequality. And I think a lot of people will think, well, this is like you said, this boom and bust is, is a feature of capitalism and, and always has been a feature of capitalism. But many people will also say, well, the alternative, which maybe you may be alluding to, uh, if we're talking about an alternative, which is in many ways, antithetical to the capitalistic system, things like communism, Marxism, or strong forms of socialism. Right. Those systems themselves have their own uh, problems, if you like. You know, they have their own issues. Um, for example, if we, if we were to assume, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is your view, because I'm not sure exactly what, you, what your view is on this. Right. But if we were to assume that the government is going to now possess or take all the means of production for itself and now distribute uh, in an egalitarian type of way, the means of production, and thus people will not have property rights, or they will not have, um, you know, employment rights, and so on and so forth. Then, the issues that commonly are asked, or the questions that are commonly asked with this type of system, will be pronounced. Things like, where is meritocracy uh, in this kind of system? Or mer meritocracy would be something which is much de-emphasized in this kind of system. A lazy person, if you want to put it in colloquial terms, can be a, a rewarded for his laziness or her laziness. It could be the case also that you have a transition to a kind of uh, authoritarian system because now the, the government has all this means of production and many would use, I'm not saying this is um, you know, the reason, but many would use the examples of you know, Lenin and Stalin and Mao and so on and so forth as examples of you know, where the opposite, which is communist or Marxist kinds of systems, would also go wrong. So having, having said that, in terms of um, your diagnostic with capitalism, what makes you confident about, and if you, if you are indeed uh, confident about this, what makes you confident that a socialist or a Marxist system uh, or, or some kind of uh, left-leaning uh, fiscally economic um, system would be better than, uh, or, or not even better than, would, would be the solution? Well, it's a very, you know, it's in what we call in this country, the $64,000 question. Yeah. It's the question that that's from a, a television show that asks who, want, who wants to be a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. People money. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very important question. I'm glad you asked it. Let me respond if I can. Yes. Uh, but before I do about meritocracy, as I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. I am uh, the product of the most elite schools this country has. And I have benefited personally uh, throughout my life mm. from that fact. Uh, whenever I, because I'm a critic of capitalism, because I do uh, admit and, and I don't run away from having learned an enormous amount from the Marxist tradition of criticism of capitalism. Yeah. And since I don't shy away from that, uh, I have been, uh, I've had to have 
problems in my life because of my political perspective. And whenever I have, I've waived my pedigree, having gone to the right universities. And usually the folks back away because they are intimidated by the pedigree and they leave me alone, which is part of why I've been a professor in, uh, in American universities. I'm on television literally every day now, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why do I tell you this? Because meritocracy is a wonderful idea. I'm yeah. sure it would be interesting to live in a society that works that way. But I can assure you that the United States is not, was not, and is nowhere near being such a place. Uh, and if, if you think it is, then I take my hat off to the public relations uh, people for having persuaded folks um, of such a thing. I was surrounded at all of these institutions by young men and women, some of whom were and still are my personal friends. But merit is not what they had. They had parents with money who got them into the right school at the right time, who've carried them all their lives. It's been a, a, a source of support for them, which they've appreciated, but it's also been a condemnation to ambivalence about learning, uh, about human relationships. And I know this all from very close uh, observation uh, mm -hmm. with these folks. Uh, most of those of us who were quote unquote successful in these universities came from less well-off families who were able to get their kids like me, my parents had no money at all, into these institutions at the various moments when they were open uh, to people who had some intellectual interests. But no, in this country, the, the, mm. the honest statement is where you end up in, in life is not dependent on what you know, it's dependent on who you know, mm -hmm. and that is well, well understood. I don't mm -hmm. know what a, a government run systems uh, arrangements would be. My assumption, not that different, but in any case, Meritocracy is a wonderful idea. I wish somebody would actually try to set that up, mm -hmm. but uh, we haven't managed so that. In the you've kind of alluded, alluded this. I probably agree with you on, 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 on those comments, uh, or at least a large part of them. But the, the, the point I'm making here is that if you did have a communist system, meritocracy or the idea of merit... I don't know. Uh, yeah. No, no, I, un I understand. Let me get yeah. to that. Yeah. It, here's the way I would answer uh, yes, I am part of the left. I am part of the socialist, communist, Marxist, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, left, it's critical of capitalism. Yeah. But I'm also <clears throat> a product of the last century. Mm -hmm. I have seen what happened in the Soviet Union or mm -hmm. China or Vietnam or Cuba or any of the other societies that have tried in one way or another uh, to depart from the capitalism that I grew up in and that I know best which is what we tend to call private capitalism in the sense that the largest part of the economy is privately owned and operated capitalist enterprises. Mm -hmm. Now, from my learning, I know that from the beginning of certainly of Marxism, uh, Marx dies in 1883, so for the last 150 years since he passed on, there's been a tradition of using his thinking to criticize capitalism, and then once the Soviet Union revolution happens, to try to install it. And I know, and I hope you do, that there have been long, deep, bitter disagreements, debates, alternatives within the Marxian tradition as to what the words he wrote meant, what the critique should be, what the alternative might look like. There isn't one, there isn't the socialist response. There never was. There are socialist responses. And one of the things folks like me, and boy, am I not alone here. One of the things we've learned is that the alternative to the capitalism we are critics of is not to have the state come in and do it. It is not to have the state take over industry, for example, yeah. neither by regulation, sort of the European social democratic uh, system, nor the Soviet or Chinese type where the government, uh, it's not true anymore in China, but it was for a while that the government literally displaces the private uh, capitalist and runs the businesses 
itself. Mm -hmm. We see, we see that that didn't do what our criticism of capitalism aims at achieving. Right. What it did do, and that's a whole other discussion, is it replaced the private employer with the government as the ultimate employer. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. That's a shift in our view from a private capitalism to a state-run capitalism. Because for us, and here Marx is crucial, the key thing about capitalism is the relationship between the two players in this system, the employer and the employee in capitalism. It's the employer who has all the power, makes all the key decisions about every enterprise, every mm -hmm. factory, every store, every office. A tiny group of people, the owner, uh, the board of directors, mm -hmm. the major shareholders, whatever they are, tiny group of people make the decisions for the vast majority, the employees, mm -hmm. and that's how the system works. For us, that's the problem. And that's not solved mm -hmm. if you get rid of the private citizen in the employer position mm -hmm. and substitute for that a public official in the employer position, mm -hmm. which is largely what the Soviet Union, for example, mm -hmm. did. Our view mm -hmm. is that the problem is that relationship the employer-employee relationship, and that what needs to be done and what socialism means for us in the 21st century mm -hmm. is the radical transformation of the enterprise so that it becomes not a hierarchical employer-employee structure, mm -hmm. but instead a democratic community in which all the players whatever their function in the division of labor within the enterprise, one person, one vote, they decide with debate, discussion, and mm -hmm. majority rule what to produce, what technology to use, where to carry out the production, and what to do with the profits that all of them together have helped to produce. Yeah. The democratization of the enterprise structure internal is what we think the future holds as a solution to both the problems of private capitalism with which we began our conversation today mm -hmm. and the problems of the state capitalism that were the efforts of the last century to go beyond capitalism. Mm -hmm. I believe those efforts are now exhausted. We mm -hmm. learned much, much was accomplished. Many terrible mistakes were made. Mm -hmm. We're ready for the next phase. Right. So let me tell you, I'll put my cards on the table as where, where I kind of, um, my, where my position is. So obviously I'm, I'm coming from the Islamic tradition. Um, right. and, um, and actually Islam does have discussions on economics and obviously um, uh, zakat is one of the pillars of Islam. Right. But um, in terms of where we stand in, on this discussion uh, or where I stand and maybe many will agree is, yeah, so the capitalism, we don't agree with it, but we also don't agree with communism. Um, and so the reason why is because um, in terms of capitalism, you've, you've talked about the inequality problem and you've talked about the instability problem. For us, um, I, I really don't think that there is a push towards an equality of outcome from the Islamic perspective. In other words, and, and the reason why we base, well, we have this judgment, or at least I have this judgment, is because of a well-known saying of the Prophet. So basically some people came to the Prophet Muhammad and they asked him, um, some people were raising the prices in a market. Okay, so, right. and, uh, so they asked him to basically lower the prices in which he responded. He said that God is the one who sets the prices. In other words, I'm not going to get myself involved in setting, lowering and, and, and increasing prices. Um, so because, because that's not really, it's not my position. And so from that, there, there seems to be like a free market kind of understanding from that obviously demand and supply based but at the same time there's a redistribution understanding as well because of zakat and it's, there's eight recipients of zakat or eight categories of recipients of them is um of the people who basically don't have money or uh, the, the faqir or the one who is impoverished or right. those who don't have enough to fulfill their basic needs and so on but it would seem to me that from from this perspective um the economic inequality factor although is something which is not necessarily desirable. It's not something which is seen as 
immoral from the Islamic perspective, so long as the basic needs of that individual is being met. And in fact, there is a verse in the Quran to that effect, which says, um, uh, that, that we have actually allowed some of you to exceed others in levels uh, and in, uh, so, so you can use or that they can, they can use other people for employment purposes you can even I'm not sure that's a good, the employment would be the, the right kind of translation but you could, uh, they can use them for their own advantage which seems to me to be exactly against what Marx would say because obviously surplus value the idea that um, you know that the, 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 the employer-employee relationship is an exploitative one at its core. Basically, this is my understanding of Marxism: that when you have this hierarchy, the employer-employee relationship, then there's an exploitation going on by necessity, almost because there's a surplus value. And, and so, Marxism for me seems to say, well, what we need to do is we need to kind of abolish this, um, so that the hierarchy is eliminated and. It seems to be the assumption from uh, from what I'm hearing from you is that the inequality is a bad thing in all cases. Um, and so even when it comes to equality of outcome, we, we want to achieve equality of outcome. Whereas what it seems to me from, from the reading of my tradition is that uh, equality of outcome is not a desirable objective. And in fact, um, the burden of proof would be the, upon the one who's making the claim. So in other words, if someone says equality of outcome is, is a desirable objective that everyone should have the same kind of money or the same kind of uh, 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 you know resources and they shouldn't be this kind of hierarchical structure of employee employee and that is an exploitative one at its core then the person who's making this claim it seems to be a very epistemologically heavy claim with many assumptions would have to prove in the first instances uh, instance that um, that it's an undesirable that that is an exploitation an objectively true exploitation number one and number two that it would be desirable to have equality of outcome so that it would seem before we can get to the point of saying we inequality is a bad thing which seems to be like a very like general wide thing to say two problems would have to be solved one of them is how do you know or how can you prove that equality of outcome when it comes to economics is a good thing and how can you prove that the employer-employee relationship or surplus value, whatever you want to call it, is in fact an ex exploitative thing uh, at all if from an objective kind of perspective? Sure, let, let, let me respond, which I think I can. Um, yeah. First, a couple of, of, of points where we may disagree. Yeah. Um, notice that I tried to stress that there are different interpretations of socialism and Marxism. And yeah. as with all you know, great traditions of thinking, there are disagreements and varieties of interpretation. Yeah. From the little bit I know about Islam, it's true of that tradition too, that That's there right. are differing perspectives on, on how to read the Quran, how to yeah. interpret it, and how to understand uh, the writings and contributions of great thinkers in the Islamic tradition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I would guess that some of them are probably closer and some of them are further from the perspective within Marxism mm -hmm. that I've tried to argue. Number mm -hmm. one. Number two, my apologies for the no telephone, but it's, uh, um, okay. Um, number one. Number two, uh, let's be clear. I mm -hmm. did not advocate some kind of blanket equality, neither right. of quote opportunity nor quote outcome. Mm -hmm. That's not the issue, the mm -hmm. issue would be, if, if I make myself clear, mm -hmm. is that, for example, in an mm -hmm. enterprise run democratically, mm -hmm. one of the decisions that would be made democratically is what range of difference among uh, the people in an enterprise, including difference in income mm -hmm. or wage or salary or whatever words you want, would be appropriate, that that is a socially determined and should be democratically determined range of difference. But there right. is no presumption or not, none is needed in the argument I'm making okay. that they would decide, they might, but there's mm. no presumption that mm. they would have to decide that everybody gets the same. That, that, right. that, that's usually been, I'm not saying you did this, but mm. usually that kind of image has been used as a bit of a, uh, a caricature in order right. to you know, criticize the, the, the position, that's yeah. not necessary. Mm -hmm. But let me give you an example of why this is, 
this idea is important. Yeah. Over the last um, eight months here in the United States, as mm -hmm. I said, 300,000 people have died of the COVID-19 right. uh, and 60 a million, a third of our labor force has had to go into unemployment during which whatever savings they have were used up, uh, during which they leaned on their family and relatives and friends and neighbors for help at a time when the friends and neighbors weren't able to help them or couldn't do much. And so we've had a massive diminution in the standard of living of at least half our population. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm gonna give you one example. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Bezos, mm -hmm. the owner and CEO uh, of the, um, just escapes me right now, Amazon mm -hmm. Corporation, I assume you know what that is. Yep. Um, his, for his personal fortune mm -hmm. went from roughly $130 billion mm -hmm. to over $200 billion. Right. If we took away $180 billion mm -hmm. from this man, mm -hmm. we could, he, by the way, that would leave him with $20 billion and he would then be among the 100 richest people in this country and in the world. Mm -hmm. That 180 billion could save the lives and transform the lives of tens of millions of his fellow citizens. That's how capitalism now works. Mm -hmm. This level of inequality is what this system produces, just as it produces wealth at one pole, uh, say in Western Europe, and poverty in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to tell you that. You know that better than but, I do. But what gives I, us the right to take, for example, with that analogy, what would give us the right to take 180 billion from that, from that man? Like, uh, the, mo the, the moral yeah. imperative yeah. that a man who can continue to be among the richest in our community mm -hmm. would enable by that movement of wealth to do something for the larger community mm -hmm. that it has already done for him. He's paying back. The mass of people produced the surplus that gives him that income. So that he, is that moral imperative premised or in some way uh, predicated by the idea that that level of inequality should not exist within a society. That it, level may or, of... it may or may not. That's, that's really not relevant here. Mm -hmm. What you have is a need and a desire on the part of, I don't mm -hmm. know, I'll pick a number, 30 million people who could be helped by this, by doing this mm -hmm. on the one hand, and the desire of Mr. Bezos not to have that money taken from him. Yeah, I get that. That's exactly parallel mm -hmm. to the fact that there are, I don't know, two or three million people who mm -hmm. work in Amazon warehouses yeah. where they are driven like, I've worked there, mm -hmm. driven like animals, mm -hmm. paid an absurdly low amount of money, yeah. which brings them to work only because in this society, if they didn't take that job, they'd be in even worse circumstances. So they take the job knowing that for every hour that they work for mm -hmm. Mr. Bezos, they add to the services he sells more value than he pays them in a wage, which is why he hires them. He mm -hmm. wouldn't hire them because mm -hmm. that's how capitalism works. You never hire a worker unless the worker produces more for you than it costs you to yeah. have him come that's Monday right. through Friday from nine to five. Yeah. So you are producing a surplus that yeah. enriches Mr. Bezos at your expense. Yeah, so yeah. Now but, the question, well, let but, me finish. Yeah, sorry, now the question becomes, yeah. what does Mr. Bezos do yeah. For you. And you know, if Mr. Bezos insists, and if I were advising him, I would tell him this. Yeah. And by the way, I am advising people like him, and I do tell them what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> For a good long while, you may get away with this. Mm -hmm. But a time will come 
when you won't, and how you act now will determine what happens to you when this imbalance is corrected. All right. It, th there's a few things there that, once again, it, it kind of forces me back to the assumptions of the entire uh, project, right? Because okay. once again, we're, we are assuming a few things. We're assuming that um, 180 uh, million, uh, sorry, billion dollars would would be justifiably taken away from him, or and or that that level of inequality should not exist within uh, society. By the way, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree with the sentiment. There's actually a verse in the Quran which says, so it doesn't become a circulation among the rich among you. So I'm not I'm not saying that I agree with capitalism or I agree with money being circulated among the, the higher echelons of society. But what I am saying is, um, at what point do we say, well, you have so many ideals here. You talked about democracy. Democracy is right. one political philosophy. And then you've got liberalism, which says that, you know, property should be protected. And then you have Marxism, which talks about surplus value. If we're in a society which claims to be liberal, in the case of the United Kingdom, uh, sorry, and the United States as well, uh, claims to be liberal and it claims to also be democratic, at what point do we prioritize a democratic kind of reasoning, which in this case seems to be, you know, one vote, one person, everything, everyone counts, with a liberal principle, which is that property should be protected? Um, and if we do prioritize one over the other, what allows us or gives us the the right to hierarchize? For example, the right for one person to have uh, as much a say as another person, which is the democratic side, over another, which says that property should be protected and or wealth also should be protected, which is the liberal ethic. Who is responsible for hierarchizing these uh, ideals and coming to different conclusions as a result of it? Because if we say that, what's well, more? No, 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 yeah. let, let, me let me respond. Yeah, yeah. Other otherwise, you know, you accumulate. Your points are all important. It's not yeah, that. Yeah. It's just, too many for me to respond. Uh, mm. There is no answer to that question. Yeah. History answers that question. Liberalism mm. is the ideology of capitalism. Mm. It says if, the cap if I can hire you yes. and I can rip you off by making you produce more value than I pay for you. Look, mm. I could show you, it's easy to do in economics. I could show you that by hiring, let's pick someone, John or Mary, it doesn't matter. By hiring that individual, yep. I now have $50 an hour more goods or services to sell as a job. Someone could say, so what? What's the problem with that? Yeah, yeah, let, 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 me, yeah. Do, let me do it, okay? Yeah. So I, I hire you, I have $50 more because your labor, your use of your brains mm. and your muscle added $50 worth of output yeah. that I can sell. And mm. I really appreciate your coming there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to give you half of what you produce. I'm going to give you $25 an hour yeah. in, to show you my appreciation for your giving me $50 worth of output. Okay. Your labor, okay? Yeah. So I'm I'm really happy because I'm getting fifty, and in exchange I'm giving you twenty five. Mm -hmm. And the only and, and your answer to me would then be, uh, yeah. wait a minute, it's my effort, my brains, my mm -hmm. muscle; those are mm -hmm. finite resources. Mm -hmm. I my labor produces fifty. I don't want to be given twenty five. Mm -hmm. Because I did the work, you didn't, I did. So I want the full value of what I have added to this mm -hmm. enterprise's output. Mm -hmm. And you say to me, sorry, 25 is all you get. And I know that that's going to work because I know that if you don't take this job, mm -hmm. the next job you can get will give you 24 so, so you're talking you're gonna, really this is surplus value. You're 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 talking to absolutely, us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so I just want you to understand from that perspective, yeah. what Mr. Bezos is accumulating mm -hmm. is the surplus yeah. that he squeezes out of millions of employees. That yeah. in this way, he's like a pharaoh in ancient uh, Egypt or something, <laughs> yeah. with you know. 10 million slaves or whatever the equivalent would be. And yeah. so he can build a pyramid and he can live the way they did, et cetera, et cetera. 
there is but, no... but there, there is one there is one i would say one major difference between the two uh okay. the major difference would be that in the case of the the pharaoh uh, or ramses or ramses the yeah. uh, if you want to take the biblical historian seriously on that you know yeah. whoever it may be that's enslaving populations in the ancient time with um with the owner of amazon the, the the employer the employees have a choice they can either get into that contract or they don't or they don't have to get into that contract whereas in 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 a, in a, in a purely slave type relationship the choice is not there in the first place there's no choice at all the you're, 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 it's either you're going to be my slave or you're going to be my slave there's no third option to that but with that one you, you can either be employed with that surplus uh in place or you don't have to be employed with that surplus in place the, the, and, then, the, and then and then what happens to you what happens to you you can you have a you have an opportunity to be to be the one who's uh setting up the surpluses or or being the beneficiary of it by being an employer yourself and or uh, oh, you can oh, be oh, oh, wait wait a minute the only way you can do that is if you have capital which is what workers don't have i don't think that's always true like especially not in today's um society where you can you, there's some startup businesses and so on that you can start with literally no capital whatsoever you can start off with an account on um in the internet and you can start making money from the beginning or you can have very limited capital and then literally but, just but, but, yeah. just between do you actually believe that what you just said really i think there are many examples of companies if you look if you look at them that started with very limited capital but then uh continue yes, to be yeah. businesses grow but, but yeah. that's a different argument yeah yeah people who start businesses with no capital but we're talking about no capital the person's impoverished the person's not in a position of any he doesn't the vast, or she doesn't, yeah. the vast majority of americans the yeah. vast majority of americans yeah. not only have no capital but they have negative net worth that is the yes. debts they have yes. exceed their assets they yes. have no capital and because they have no capital yeah. they can't get access to other people's capital either yeah so that i would agree with you i don't think there should be an economy or in a society where there with people with debt and in fact one of the one of the uh, there recipients is, the way, what, what, yeah yeah well, one of the recipients from, like from my perspective the religious perspective one of the recipients of zakat would be an indebted person uh, so so someone who does who has what you've just described uh, is is a uh, in negative. Well, that's what I do. well, wait a yeah. minute. Then, then you're agreeing with me because that's on how this we point. Yeah, the, on the on that's this how point, we I would agree solve the problem. We would take from Mr. Bezos his 180 yes. billion, or if I yeah. had my way, much more than that. But we would wow. take 100. But, I could we, compromise. Yeah. I could compromise. We take 180 billion and we transfer it so that, for example, we eliminate. Yes. No, no. Said. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that we should not have a robust system of redistribution in an economy. I'm saying that we should have it. Um, I, I, I think the 180 billion is, is we're talking about, you know, we 90, 90, 90 percent, 90 percent tax. Over over the last 40 years, I could show you yeah. if you were interested. No, no. With over that, the, no. With this point, the, the sentiment here, I agree with. Yeah. Yeah, but over the last 40 years, yeah. we have had a massive redistribution of wealth. Here in the United States, we yes. have had the undoing of the New Deal. We have erased everything that was accomplished in the 1930s mm. and more so. By yeah, now, with that kind of thing, we don't agree with. Yeah, so I would, I would on that, right. but, on but that, yeah, all, we agree. Yeah, with, on all, that we agree. With, all, with all due respect, yeah. we, the agreement is very nice. But yeah. what we needed was social movement to mm. prevent that from happening. And right. because it didn't, you are now seeing, as yes. I'm sure you will, a movement against capitalism yes. because of the inequality mm. that it continues. Even, you know, we have our politicians. Think of it this way. Look at the spectacle. Politicians, left and right, Democrat, Republican, I'm talking the U.S. here, of mm -hmm. course, but it's similar in other countries. We have the politicians telling us we all have to work together to get through this pandemic, to get through this um, health crisis that the world faces, and blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, we're all together fighting this thing. That is, if you pardon me, BS. That's mm -hmm. nonsense, because what's underlying that is a continuation of a ro really radical redistribution of wealth by a system that yes. is not only failing mm. to deal with the public health crisis, mm -hmm. but continues 
having been already the most unequal capitalism in the world, mm -hmm. to become more so. Yes. This, this is no, agreed, usually, agreed. No, I, I, I think the diagnostic happens, here. Yeah, this is I think, usually what happens when systems are about to crash. I think that point is, is definitely true. I think when you're talking about, I, I guess how I would answer that question from within my own tradition, I would say that the, it's not about inequality being completely undesirable. It's about the extent to which inequality is undesirable. And, and I think the extent to which un, inequality is undesirable from my own tradition is where it leads to people being indebted in the minuses, as you've just mentioned, and or it leads to people not having housing or it leads to people not having access to medical treatment or the basics. And with that, there should be a robust system of redistribution. And so on that, we do ag agree, although probably we'd have different prescriptions. I mean, if we were, you know, in charge or so on. But he here's something I would want to um, ask you. I mean, this is probably one of the defining features of the Islamic system in terms of economics is the eradication of interest completely. Right. Yeah. So th that is probably one of the most dramatic things which any capitalist would be um, completely against. But this aspect of riba or usury or interest um, how would you think, I'm just kind of getting from your experience, how do you think an economy would, or what would you think an economy would look like if we slowly but surely got rid of interest? Would you think it would flatten the boom and bust that you were talking about in the beginning of the segment where you're talking about four to seven years of boom and bust? Do you, do you reckon um, that economic depressions will be less uh, uh, pr pronounced and uh, at the same time, booms will be also flattened out a little bit? What do you think um, would happen if banks were told they can't charge interest rates or even or, or governments and or banks as well? Well, you know, again, it's one of these uh, decisions. It's like mm. any other market. I mean, I look at interest as you know, there's a market in money. And if you want to borrow money uh, under the yes. current situation, uh, you can do that if you have collateral and if you pay interest and blah, blah, blah. I'm fully aware that both in the Islamic tradition and for that matter, also in the in the Christian tradition, mm -hmm. there are long periods of time, Middle Ages in Europe, for example, when there was uh, the Roman Catholic Church was dominant and it prohibited what it called usury, which mm -hmm. is basically the charging of interest. And it comes out of a biblical tradition, mm -hmm. which says that if another person needs your help, Mm. Your job as a good Christian is to give that person help. Mm -hmm. And it is not helpful to demand more back from the person you're helping than you gave them. Mm. That undercuts and destroys the whole notion of charity yes. and of giving alms and yes. of being a good Christian, blah, blah, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that. I think, by the way, mm -hmm. in the history of capitalism, there have been movements. There mm -hmm. are today either to eliminate interest or to radically control interest. Mm. For example, among the 50 states here in the United States, there's quite a bit of difference. You cannot charge certain levels of interest in some states that you can charge in others because yeah. there have been social movements that either asked to eliminate interest mm. or to control it. Then there are, for example, movements quite strong among students in the United States saying that they shouldn't be charged interest for the loans required nowadays to, to get a college degree in the United States mm -hmm. and that the, uh, the, the debt that they've accumulated should be canceled, either the interest portion of it or even the principal portion of it, et cetera, et cetera, et right. cetera. So it's a contentious issue. I don't think capitalism hangs on it one way or another. Mm -hmm. There could be alternative ways of allocating capital other than using the interest rate. Uh, for me, this is the usual question of the market. And by the way, I, I'm not familiar enough with Islam to be sure, but I know in the Christian tradition, and I'm no Christian either, but in the Christian tradition, there's an equivalent uh, notion that not only should there be no interest, mm -hmm. but that there should, the price of everything, uh, and this may disagree with the, your quotation from uh, Mohammed from earlier, um, in the Christian tradition, there's a so-called just price, J-U-S-T, the price of justice, with the justice being derived from the Bible, yeah. that something should be priced. By the way, the, 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 the literature suggests yeah. that what is just is that the price should reflect 
the toil and trouble of the worker who produces the object. Yeah, Marx will say uh, that will never be the case, right? Excuse me? Mark, Mark, Marx would, interject, would, would say that that would never be the case by virtue of the hierarchy in the first place. Well, it's not so much hierarchy. It's that the system as a whole yeah. cannot, doesn't function that way. Yeah. But, but by the way, Marx is, as I understand, very mm. clear that the notion of surplus mm. is not what you referred to earlier as, quote unquote, an objective or something that has a standard mm. that makes it truer than something else. Mm -hmm. That's what human beings do. They disagree about how the world works. What a Marxist does, mm -hmm. as far as I understand it, is use the theory of surplus and value that comes out of Marx, who in turn got that idea from Smith and Ricardo and the people that preceded mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. This is one way of understanding how the world works. It's not the only one. Yeah, it yeah. is always in debate with alternatives, mm -hmm. uh, both within the Marxian tradition and outside of Just it. Just to ask you on that, do you, would you, wouldn't you say, though, because they, the Marxism is largely based on historical materialism, um, that there is a kind of push towards making this as objective as possible. Um, no, 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 no. Th that, that is a, re for me, again, yeah, I, mm. I, am, I am not speaking for all Marxists or anything yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. but in my understanding of Marxism, mm -hmm. he is a student of Hegel, his teacher yeah. in Germany, mm -hmm. and that he made that very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and for him, uh, the human community uh, mm -hmm. is a group of people who interact with the world Mm. in different ways. They mm. dress differently, they mm. sing differently, they yeah. eat in a different way, yeah. and they think in a different way. Yeah. And if I asked you the question, which is the right way to eat? With a mm. knife and fork, with your mm. fingers, with chopsticks, you'd react, I hope, and say to me, that's a silly question. There isn't a right way to eat. Mm. There are culturally, historically developed alternative ways human beings uh, nourish themselves yeah. with food and I would say yes agreed and there are also different ways they make sense of the world right. the Marxist way I understand mm. uses the apparatus of surplus to understand the world mm -hmm. and that shapes the political conclusions we come to but I'm clear that other people have alternative theoretical frameworks and that's why my sense is that it's history. It's the struggle amongst these alternatives that determines in the context of our historical situation, which of these perspectives grow, thrive and shape the world and which of them pass sort of like human beings. They are born, evolve over time and die. And this is pretty much what happens to these ways of thinking. And my discussion of capitalism was designed to make the point that what's happening in the larger framework is giving a boost to the Marxian criticism of capitalism at a depth and on a scale I had never seen in the history of the United States, yeah. certainly not in my lifetime, but in nothing that I've read about that history mm. either. By the way, just to um, uh, comment on something, there is such a thing as a kind of just price as well in the Islamic tradition. In the 83rd chapter of the Quran, there is... Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. I don't know enough, but I would yeah. have But exploitation is, is not, is, is, once again, it's not the same as, you know, a Marxian um, surplus understanding where there's... Uh, where there is this exploitation going on because of because of the, by virtue of the system or whatever way you want to put it. But going back to this question of materialism... Uh, for me, like when you use historical materialism, it, it seemed like a push to be scientific in a sense, but the, the, there is going to be a point where you move from is to or, uh, to use kind of like a David Humean um, dichotomy or um, distinction. So th th this is how the world wor worked, or this is the history of the world. There was, you know, feudalism or slavery, and feudalism and capitalism, uh, and then there's going to be communism. This kind of um, meta narrative, if you like, this is how it was. But now this is how it ought to be. This is where it becomes moralizing discourse, where it becomes um, a philo philosophizing discourse, where you're putting your own um, kind of uh, morality into it, and this is defined as exploitation. This is defined as just, and this is defined as what should happen or what ought to happen. Um, and there is where I would, f and there is why I think the discussion is really the base of um, 
of Marxism has to be premised on something as solid as possible. And I think, I really do think Marx attempted to do that. But from the is to the ought is where we have a problem or where we have an issue in terms of um, really proving that that is what exploitation is in any objective way. But if, if, if someone says, well, subjective, well, the movement from, okay, this is what happened to this is what ought to happen, um, then becomes a matter of public opinion. Then really, we can't say that uh, minimum wage should be set at this price or that price. It, then it becomes a matter of, okay, you're using chopsticks and I'm using uh, knife and fork. It becomes really a, a matter of aesthetic value judgment, really, at this point. Yeah, well, here perhaps you and I disagree. Mm. Uh, in my experience, as best I can make sense of the world around me, um, every single person, you, mm. me, and everybody else who might be drawn into this conversation, has a set of oughts. Right. If you, there are various words for this, you know, has utopian desires, mm -hmm. has dreams of a, of a better world, has, yes. uh, is drawn, for example, to religion. Yeah. as a place where uh, a better world or a set of oughts is articulated that you vibrate to, that, that means something to you, that, that you embrace in some sense. We all have that, That's right. number one. Uh, they, they, we differ about them, but we all have these desires, um, especially those who suggest that they don't have it. They, for them, the problem is they yeah. have it, but they need to deny it. It's a little bit like... What, what we've learned from psychology over the last hundred years. Yes. And I'm also, this just my persuasion, I'm also persuaded that for everybody, you, me, and everybody else, the oughts we have are part of our mental apparatus and shape the quote unquote objective reality we try to grasp. In mm -hmm. other words, we don't have some wall between the desires, the hopes, the dreams, the utopian longings on the mm. one hand yeah. and the analytic apparatus we deploy on the other. I, I find the notion that one of them is quote unquote subjective and the other one objective to be fundamentally nonsense. Your, your ability to formulate a utopian dream is as objectively determined as everything else. That is, it's a product of the whole world you live in. The, the minister, the imam, their parents, your, so, uh, your, your loved ones, all of those things, your political experience, your job, they shape both your analytic capability and your utopian longings, which shape each other in the process as well. And I find the so-called distinction subjective, objective, useless. Unless it means, and then it becomes trivial, subjective is you alone, and objective is the larger society, but yeah. that's just a collection of subjects. No, in, in, in the sense that, like, for example, if uh, science works in a very systematic way, and obviously social science is an attempt to mimic it in many ways, but if if, social, if science worked in the way that you've just described, then it would be very difficult to establish anything because if you go into the laboratory oh, and you... No, but it, but no, it does. Physical or natural science, chemistry, yeah. biology, mathematics, it is exactly what I just said. That's how it is. It in is a sense? proposition. Look, people mm. right now are debating whether the, the world is best understood as an energy flow or as a set of particles. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a distinction between quanta of one or the other. And mm -hmm. they can't agree literally on what matter is. No, no I accept that. What, what I mean is that, there, for example, we have controlled conditions that all of us can. When we speak in the, in the language of mathematics, we're all speaking in exactly the same language. So when, no, when we. No, no, but really, sir, in yeah. all due respect. Yeah. I'm a mathematician before I became an economist. Tell me why. If this we is have radically question. different ways of understanding what a number is, what a field is, what okay. a set is, mm -hmm. uh, what words like large or small or infinity or mm -hmm. any other basic mathematical uh, concept is an object of debate. And by the way, it's very important to grasp that. Otherwise, you become fixated on something as 
permanent when nothing is. You I get that, and I've also read Godel in terms of incompleteness theory, and and really have uh, I understand where you're coming from in terms of the axioms of science. Uh, of better, better than Godel is Heisenberg that what mm. whatever you think is going on in the physical universe mm -hmm. is shaped by how you think of the that universe, how you constructed the microscope, the telescope, or any other tool you use mm. has already in it the theory at the time that object was created what would that you you're now using. Would, would you agree that there's more of a symbiotic type of relationship between actors? That in a sense, this Kantian notion that we are the ones who are kind of projecting the reality onto the world rather than the reality being extra extracted from the world. Um, well, it's, for me, it's, it's always both. I, this yes, is so, yeah. The world yeah. shapes us, including... Yeah. how we understand that the world is so there's so a symbiosis how, how we understand the world shapes the world right how the world is shapes our understanding of it but we're speaking english together now and we, we're using uh, sentences Absolutely. right and, and so if we didn't have the same understanding of what in a sense a noun is or maybe not in a grammatical sense but at least in a conversational sense we would not we wouldn't be able to have this conversation so there, there's there are some oh, basic oh, building oh, blocks. i don't oh. I've done this work. I don't agree with that. Go on. I don't believe that you and I, when we use the word noun in a sentence, talking to each other, mm -hmm. we have a convention, you and I. Mm -hmm. It's because of our histories, our, our cultural developments. Mm -hmm. You and I are having a conversation and we right. are using words, the same words, let's call it the word noun, for example. Mm -hmm. But I don't infer from that at all. Mm -hmm. that we have the same meaning for that word. We're mm -hmm. just agreeing not to worry about that now. There will mm -hmm. come a time if you and I continue this conversation, if we develop it, if we apply it, if we see merit in, in continuing, mm -hmm. we will come at a certain point and to realize, you and I both, that we meant something else Right. Then we thought the other one meant yeah, when yeah. we use that word. There's always going to be like a, a, an interpretive scope in terms of language, but but then but then again, the, the language is meaningful by definition, right? Yes, otherwise, it's not the same meaning. Yeah, yeah it's not the same. It's not mean, meaningful. Man. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. What? Otherwise, we, this conversation would be um, like jibber jabber. We wouldn't be able to have a conversation. If, if, there were, if no, language. No, no, that, that's, yeah. a, that's an extreme either or. It's not either right. or. Yeah. We're, having, we're, we're deriving meanings, mm. which is why we're doing this. You thought there would be some meaning in talking to me, and I thought mm. the same vis a vis talking to you. And yeah. I feel that way now. I'm, I'm, yeah. I find this interesting. Yeah. But I have no illusion, because that's what I think it would be. Mm -hmm that you and I don't have all kinds of issues already lurking in the sentences we have given each other, but mm -hmm. that haven't yet risen to the point that you and I want to talk about them. Mm -hmm. uh, just like we went for quite a while before we got to this epistemological question, mm -hmm. I think conversation happens all the time between people who do not agree what the meaning is of the words they're using, yeah. but get other kinds of benefits out of the interaction. I think, for example, yep. that I will be provoked in ways I can't even specify yet by your re telling me hmm. um, in passing that mm -hmm. the Islamic tradition also has a kind of uh, just price kind of idea. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, that's gonna stay in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when I will pursue it or how I will pursue it, yeah. but it has a meaning to me. Mm -hmm. And at some point I'll figure that out. And if mm -hmm. you and I are talking, mm -hmm. we will laugh with one another that what you meant and what I got were not the same. And yeah. that's not aberrational. It doesn't have to be the same for us to get value out of conversation. It never was. If I can give you the example that I use when I teach, when young people get together and find themselves attracted to one another and they say, you are my friend or uh, you are my uh, beloved, mm -hmm. it turns out it takes quite a while for the two of them to figure out what each of them meant when they used such words with one yeah, another. So sometimes people can speak cross purposes, right?
That's that's basically the thing. Again, yeah. you're polarizing. I don't mean a, it's not it's not cross purposes. It's mm. just different. It takes time right. to work out the differences. And here's the irony: it's very Hegelian. Mm. Mm-hmm. As you work out the differences over one word, you produce new differences in the very words you use. Yeah. It never stops. But yeah. that doesn't mean there isn't communication. Right. It means communication and identity are not the same. Never yeah. work. But you see, this is a very important thing because when, when you use the term, so now we've talked about it in the context of language, but now we, when we kind of apply this to the meta ethic, if you like, when you use the term exploitation, um, and uh, for example, if we use it in a, in a Marxian way, and we say it's a surplus value, for example, exploitation, or these key terms associated with Marxist philosophy, if it's not meant to be understood by a collective at least, then it becomes impossible to act upon the content material. Because if, if what we're saying is that everyone can understand exploitation whatever way they want to, or everyone can understand surplus value in whatever way they please, then there will not be uh, an impetus or even... An, uh, an ability for a collective to come out and say, well, let's do what, you know, a communist revolution or let's do this or that. Because in that, in, in that setting, everyone's got different ideas and there is no measurement of exploitation. Exploitation becomes an arbitrary ad hoc figment of the subject's um, interpretation. I know, but you keep looking for something beyond that. Yeah. Look, when I, when I go and I talk to people about the surplus, here's mm. what I'm hoping for. Yeah that the very complicated differences among all the people in a room, Mm -hmm. students, workers, uh, whatever is gathered, Mm -hmm. however big or small the collective may be, five people, 5,000 people. And I I address groups of all different sizes. I mean, we don't now because of COVID, but we used to. Um, My hope is that these words, this theory of the surplus, as I articulate it, touches them mean something to them. Do I understand that they are all going to have to agree with my mean? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. That, that's not going to happen. I don't mm-hmm. think that ever happened. Right. I think every social movement is a collection of a large number of people with very different ideas, but who all understand that they need one another and they're going to work out or maybe suspend for a while their disagreements or their differences because mm. they have something else in addition to those that they want to accomplish and they understand they can't do that individually. They mm. have to do that collectively. And mm. I, I argue that's mm. what we're doing. Yes. And this theory that I'm about to explain is a way for us to achieve this outcome, which this collective has an interest in pursuing. Mm-hmm. And I hope that works because yeah. that's all theory ever was. Mm. So let me ask you one of the pre um, kind of last questions I'm going to ask you, because it's been a pleasure really speaking yes, to you and, and talking I, to you. And I, by the way, I appreciate yeah. that your interests were not just what usually passes for economics, but went into philosophy and epistemology. And mm. if that's part of your, your Islamic commitment, my hat's off to you. That makes a much better conversation. No, for real. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very it's a very productive conversation for me. Obviously, speaking to someone of your eminence, one of the most influential, really, professors of, uh, who's seen as uh, a Marxist. I'm not sure if you d- describe yourself as such, uh, but it's been I, it's a I learning experience for me. I don't, but I'm happy if you do. No problem. <laughs> I was going to say is that in terms of a robust theory of justice, because a lot of the underpinning of this is about justice and injustice. Obviously, yes. Um, my question to you is very straightforward do you ever think that justice can be achieved in this world if we're talking about society economics or politics do you do you do you start off um like because you've elaborated upon what you see as problematic with what's going on in the economy and you've talked about the 1930s example and the wall street crash and great depression fdr and then moved all the way up to 2008 you know and today with the pandemic these are all injustices, and I think both of us will agree with, with that uh, to some extent, using different paradigms and different understandings, but coming to maybe a similar conclusion. But do you think, therefore, um, that justice is achievable 
economic, political or social in this world? Or do you think that really uh, justice is not achievable at all? Well, you know, I, th I think of justice as a, a moving target. Mm. Maybe that's the best way for me to put it. Yes. Uh, I think the notion of what is just has always changed over time. Um, I don't see a reason to believe that won't continue. Mm. Uh, I think it is part of the history of the human race to formulate notions of justice, mm -hmm. uh, to seek uh, a criticism of societies uh, on the base. And I mean by society, everything as little as a household or as big mm -hmm. as a as a large community, uh, that, that there are concepts of justice that we use to understand our environment, whether it's a household or a, or, or a whole country or anything in between. Mm -hmm. um, and that it, it represents what we mentioned earlier, a, mm -hmm. a utopian longing for a way of interacting with one another that is somehow honorable to one another, that is that is rooted in a kind of solidarity, appreciation of human life and of its mm -hmm. possibilities and of, of the emotions and relationships that we're able to construct. And to be able to look at a society and say, look, it isn't working here. It is falling short here. Um, will we get to some, some state of, of, of perfection in some sense? of justice, I doubt it. I, my suspicion is that we will, we will make progress, we will move in a certain direction, fueled and shaped by a notion of justice, but in the very process of moving in a direction given to us by a notion of justice, yes. that very movement will again change, here's Hegel again, change yeah. the notion of justice so that it's a, it's a feature it's a feature of life. So I, the short answer is no, I don't think we'll probably uh, ever get to a place where we think we're done, where we have arrived at some, yes. I, don't, you know, I don't think that. I think and I, that and I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, even, even though obviously I come from a tradition which is um, religious in nature and obviously um, the ideas of Sharia law, which is obviously a taboo subject, just as Marxism is in, in American circles, uh, among people, but the idea of these um, divinely inspired laws, um, which are meant to produce the best results, I think a lot of people caricature them in a, in a very similar way that people caricature Marxist understanding, because the Muslim position is that the Muslim position is not that um, we we put in these laws or taking away, taking away usury or putting in systems of redistribution or allowing the market to set its own prices, the things that we said are part of the Islamic tradition in order to get justice in this world because justice in this world from the islamic paradigm is actually unattainable and that's why uh, it's relegated to the eschaton in that sense and there's this whole thing called the day of judgment or literally yom ad -Din, which literally means the day where debt is redeemed because deen comes from the arabic word dain which which literally means debt because everyone's going to be indebted to somebody else, not just in economic terms. And I think this is moving more into Weberian kind of ana analysis, but also in sociological terms where people are unjust to each other in actions and, and behaviors and so on and so forth. And therefore everything is relegated to the eschaton, to the afterlife, to the day of judgment. And, and, and therefore it's kind of like an, uh, it's kind of it is an ideal state. Um, but then the, the realization that you're not going to get what you deserve or you're not even going to be given what you deserve in this world i think although it is in many ways a, a a sad thing to think about being grounded in that reality gives one in many ways more hope of uh, what to expect and being more of a realist so i would agree with the fact that justice can't be established in this world because um, this is the reason from the Islam perspective for, you know, God, one God, the creator God and so on and uh, so forth, having uh, this day of judgment, the eschaton, where he, he literally, uh, any exploitation that has been done will be uh, basically fixed on that day. Um, but it's been, it's been a pleasure talking to you, really, it has. And um, I'm going to leave some of the, because if people want to know more about socialism, you have written books about introduction to social, I think it's called introduction to socialism, isn't it? Understanding socialism. Oh, yeah. understanding socialism. And other books, you've, you've, 
produce many books. So I'll put something in the description box for people to see in order to, because I do believe that people need to be literate when it comes to these uh, systems. You know, they need to know, uh, you know, what what is the argument. Um, and also, if, if they are Muslim, because many people that we watch in this are going to be Muslim, to not caricature, you know, Marxist beliefs or... And one thing I've learned from you is that actually this idea that, you know, the government is going to take all the production from your perspective and then, you know, it's, it's not really what you're saying at all, is it? Not at all. Not at all. In yeah. fact, if, the thing that we emphasize here, if I could say two things to conclude. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one is that the focus for us is the democratization of the enterprise. We, mm -hmm. we stress worker co-ops as an alternative way at the base of society to reorganize the workplace on the theory that adults spend a huge part of their lives at work. You, mm -hmm. In our country here, five out of seven days, the best hour, excuse me, of those mm -hmm. days, you're mm -hmm. at work. And if you want a good society, a democratic society, then workplace should have been the first place where that democracy and that a good society should have been established. Ironically, the history of capitalism has been to exclude democracy from the workplace, even as it celebrates its own democratic nature, particularly here in this country, it is false because it is a society where the majority of people work, go to a workplace that is organized in an anti-democratic way, tiny number of people at the top making all the decisions. Notice in what I'm saying that I don't say a word about the government. It's got nothing to do with the government. It really, that, that's, that's, that's a socialism of the 20th century. Right. The new direction of socialism is this other one. The other thing, the only other thing I would say, and, and, and I mean this to be provocative in a good way. Much of what I suspect listening to you motivates um, a desire for religious activity, religious engagement, Islamic or other, isn't all that different from what motivates others to a Marxist criticism of capitalism, to get to a better place for human beings, to share their differences, to argue in a good way that teaches each of us what we can learn from the other, which is always significant. Um, I have a yearning for that kind of a society in which this kind of conversation you and I have had can end up wondering productively about the similarities of what we are trying to do, even in different languages and different cultural traditions and different images of what it is we're doing and what we're after it's a much much better way to go than to live as you put it rightly with these caricatures that i think are driven more by fear than they are by by a by an honest engagement in what we're like and where we're different i thank you so so much for this uh, brilliant experience having you on the podcast and obviously, if you want any um, more information about Islam or, or, or anything like that, so you can kind of make comparisons between Marxism and Islam or any other reason, please uh, let us know and we'll send you the material. Will do. And if you want to have this conversation at some future point again, please know I'd be glad to hear from you and to arrange to do that. Fantastic.